Can you stare down gigantic beings from the beyond and keep fighting? Or would you break down under the impression of walking skeletons? Find out with me as I walk you through stress management in Darkest Dungeon and in real life and what you can take away from it for your actual daily challenges. Hi, my name is Andy Loompa. I love video games. I also have a psychology degree. Both of these are a hobby and a passion of mine, and most of all I like to combine the two to see how well games portray the human condition. During my studies, especially my master's thesis, I focused on stress. Stress is also a major factor of Darkest Dungeon, one of my most favorite video games. Oh, and would you look at that, Red Hook Studios announced a while ago that Darkest Dungeon 2 is coming. How awesome is that? But let's get back to the topic. Stress. Stress is something we face on a daily basis and it's something everyone has heard of or dealt with at some point during their lives. But what is stress exactly? To be brief, stress is far too complicated to grasp in a 10 minute video. But as a psychologist, it is my job to understand these sort of concepts, which is why psychologists create models to simplify them. One of these models is the Transactional Stress Model by Lazarus and Lornier from 1971. I really like it because it incorporates the individual as well as the environment. It also takes the individual's skills and resources into account in how they alter their perception. Also, it was part of a master's thesis, so I'm a bit biased. Let's get into it though. According to the transactional stress model, stress is the reaction to stimuli in the environment of an individual. The intensity of that reaction depends on two factors. One is the perceived threat level and the other is the perception of the individual's resources. Let's translate that into real life. Say you have a test coming up. Is the test important? Could it mean that your school career takes a steep downward turn if you flunk it? If so, it would mean that the perceived threat level is pretty high. If your grades are already fine or if the test is not all that important after all, the perceived threat level sinks, obviously. On the other hand, we have the resources. Resources can be pretty much anything that you can fall back on to handle such a situation. Are you well versed in the topic? Did you study a lot? Can you make the test easier for yourself in any mm, other way? How much time did you have to write the test? Can you ensure that you are well rested, fed and relaxed when writing? If the answer to these questions is yes, then the stress level sinks again. The stress level then determines the severity of your physiological and psychological stress reaction. From a mild increase in heart rate, to headaches, to failure of digestion, there's a broad range of ways your body reacts to stress. There are a couple of aspects to consider when thinking about these factors though. First of all, both depend on your perception, not on objective facts. You could be in a potentially life-threatening situation and not perceive it as dangerous. At the same time, you could also be in a completely safe situation and fear for your life. The same goes for your resources. You could feel like you didn't study enough even though you'd know the textbook by heart. You could feel like you don't have enough time even though you'll just breeze through the test and finish after half an hour and walk out like a boss. Another aspect to consider is that both of these factors rely on experience and on character. Some people just have less of a problem keeping their resources handy. Some people tend to see more threats than others. Some people are just more confident in their abilities. But the more often you go through stressful events and master them, the more likely you are to see them as less stressful in the future. Obviously, this has limits in traumatic stress situations, but that is a whole another video. But how does it work on a physiological level though? This is important to understand some of the long-term effects of continued exposure to stressful events to the individual. So basically, there are two systems that govern our stress response. The sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system raises your activation level. It increases your heart rate to ensure that all important organs receive a good amount of oxygen and perform at optimal levels. There's a whole bunch more, but to keep it short and simple, the sympathetic nervous system puts your body and mind in a state of performance. The parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, lets your body return to normal again. Your digestion picks back up, the blood flow slows down, and you calm down in general. So why aren't we just always at peak performance? Well, that's rather easy. Think of a car that runs at max speed all the time. You're gonna see a lot more wear and tear. The same applies to our bodies. The fact that our digestive tract slows down during stress means that we're not as effective in taking up nutrients. The excessive strain on our hearts can damage the muscles and blood vessels. In extreme situations, the blood flow to some parts of the brain is restricted. The goal is that we can focus on the most important threats. However, after a certain point, we enter a state of shock. 
leading us to not being able to form a straight thought or forge a plan to deal with the situation. If faced with unspeakable horrors, this can be your detriment. Let's relate that to the game though, and see how Darkest Dungeon puts these concepts into practice, right? As I mentioned, stress is a major factor in Darkest Dungeon. If you don't know Darkest Dungeon, let me introduce you to it. Darkest Dungeon is a 2D dungeon crawler. In it, you move through dungeons from left to right, with your characters following one another, making up a party of up to four. The position of characters within that formation has an effect on how enemies can attack them and how the attacks of the characters work themselves. Under the health bar, every character has a stress meter that can go from 0 to 200. At 100, the characters either suffer from an affliction or become virtuous. Afflicted characters will disobey orders and increase the stress level for others and can suffer heart attacks when their stress level reaches 200. These heart attacks put the characters on death's door, where a single further hit could be permanently fatal to them. To reduce stress, you can use abilities and items within a dungeon or take part in certain activities in the hamlet between dungeon runs. Now, how realistic does the game portray stress? What are stresses or events that increase the stress level? According to the Gamepedia Darkest Dungeon Wiki, heroes in the game gain stress through being in a dungeon, through fighting, through critical hits by enemies, and through certain special attacks by enemies. Does that make sense? Let's start with the dungeons themselves. They are a hostile environment, with unspeakable horrors lurking just about the next corner, waiting to spring forth and cut you to pieces. Even a cold stone seems bent on preventing passage. Relics, old chests and traps can cause hurt, pain, disease and death. Ancient traps lie in wait, unsprung and thirsting for blood. So naturally, yes, being in a dungeon would cause an increase in stress. I also observed that heroes gain less stress from being in a dungeon if their level is higher than the dungeons. That makes sense, as the perceived threat decreases with the resources the heroes bring to the table. In this case, their experience with surviving dungeons. Fighting, naturally, is also stressful. Ringing ears, blurred vision, the end approaches. As the enemy is unrelenting and their attacks will not cease until they have put you to eternal rest. They pose a literal, mortal danger to you and your party. But just like with the dungeons, the stress gained from fighting decreases depending on the difference in level between heroes and enemies. Sticking them to the transactional stress model, this makes just as much sense as it does with the dungeons. Critical hits, however, will always cause massive stress. In the context of this game, this would be a lucky strike against an enemy's weak point, slashing through armor and exposing a gap in their defense. Defense. Heroes and enemies alike are made aware of that weak point. Their perceived resources are dwindling, as they are made aware of their mortality and the danger of their enemies pose. That definitely makes sense. The special attacks that cause stress are a bit of a mixed bag. There's the insane ramblings of madmen, songs of skeletal bards or occultists' invocations. And now, the darkness holds dominion. Black as death. It's kinda hard to group them together, but they mostly revolve about making the threat you face seem more imposing or doing something disgusting. The former obviously works within the transactional stress model, as the perceived threat seems bigger. While I can't really make out how a goblet thrown on your face would increase your stress. To sum it up, most of these make sense. Let's look at the Hamlet activities and how realistic their effect on stress is. In the Hamlet, you can either use the Abbey or the Tavern to relieve stress. In the Abbey, there's three different activities. Characters could choose to relieve stress, meditate in the cloister, praying in the transept, or be flagellated in the penance chamber. The first of the three, meditation, is particularly interesting to me, because that too was part of my master's thesis. Now, there's a lot of different kinds of meditation, but one has been researched quite a lot in connection to stress relief, and that is mindfulness meditation. This type of meditation aims to reconnect your consciousness with the here and now, while reducing the amount of judgment you cast on your current situation. One of the basic principles of mindfulness is to take everything in as it is, but not to judge it in any way or place any emotional value on it. Practiced regularly, this kind of meditation can even alter brain structure in a way that improves emotional self-regulation. In theory, this can affect the two evaluation processes involved in the transactional stress model. 
So if mindfulness meditation were applied in the Abbey, it would even have a positive effect for stress perception in the future. In fact, according to the Darkest Dungeon Gamepedia page, there's a 7.5% chance that characters emerge with positive quirks from the experience. One of the parts I love about the Cloister is that meditation can frustrate characters and give them the unquiet mind quirk. It's funny because practicing meditation can be frustrating at times when you just can't quiet the carnival in your head. Let's move on to the next one, praying. While also being sort of meditative, it probably has a different effect on heroes. The connection to the divine. Being religious is actually pretty great for stress relief, as it provides you with a transcendental resource that can potentially be available at all times. Believing that an omnipotent being looks over you and wants you to succeed will make many threats seem small in comparison. Looking through recent studies, I found religion to be a stress-relieving resource, as long as your personal values match those of the religion you are following. Not gonna lie, it's kinda hard to find studies about the positive effects of flagellation, though. However, I could theorize that flagellation either strengthens your bond to your religion, so works a bit like prayer, or that it sort of hardens you for the challenges to come. However, self-harm is theorized to actually produce endorphins to reduce the pain. That would then obviously also decrease stress as well. I would, however, strongly advise against hurting yourself to relieve stress. Let's move to the tavern, though. All three methods in the tavern mostly provide you with a distraction. Distracting oneself has its place in stress relief. You allow your autonomic nervous system to calm down. After that, it gets easier to re-evaluate the stresses, which in itself would decrease the stress levels. So yeah, the tavern activities also make sense. Now that I have sung Darkest Dungeon enough praises, let's look at what Red Hook Studios could do better in Darkest Dungeon 2. First of all, stress should be able to go down gradually on its own in a dungeon. In some dungeons, you can take breaks one or two times, implying that you spent multiple days in there. After a while, you would get accustomed to the unique stresses of that dungeon and your stress level would decrease on its own. Then there should also be a link between stress and disease. High stress levels should increase your chance for getting sick. In real life, the sympathetic nervous system shuts down your immune system, so you have all the energy you need to deal with an oncoming threat. The same could be done in-game. The aspect of trauma is somewhat misrepresented in the game. In real life, any event that poses mortal danger, especially if coupled with a feeling of helplessness, can be perceived as traumatic and elicit a traumatic response. So if a character is on death's door, they should be traumatized. This would probably be done through affliction in the game. Traumas, however, have long-lasting effects that sometimes can't be cured through whatever action you wish to take to relieve stress. For example, heroes could suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome. They'd have a lower resilience towards stress, wouldn't recover while resting, and might even get triggered. Say you were traumatized by a swine shop. Next time you encounter that enemy, that would be a trigger experience for that hero. They could be completely paralyzed, put to 100 stress momentarily, or just straight up flee from combat. I think that could even spice up the gameplay quite a bit. But what can you take away from this for your own life? Well, first of all, know this. Stress mostly depends on your personal perception of the threat facing you. If you manage to change the perspective and see your stresses for what they are, that might already help. Then it's always good to find respite and relief through calming actions like meditation or good conversation with someone who's on the same page as you. Make sure you have your allies with you and remember, the bigger the beast, the greater the glory. That's all from me for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I still have quite a few more in the pipeline, so if you do like this, uh, hit subscribe. Also, let me know what you think about the video above and how you personally deal with stress before or after a big task. Bye! Remind yourself that overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer.